I don't know why people do it voluntarily, inhale smoke, right? Why would they do it involuntarily? Um, this shows that we are fragile creatures who depend on the sovereign God. Um, I'd like to take a break from preaching Colossians and preach on evangelism as a lifestyle. Since we're beginning to start small groups, I thought it would be appropriate to talk about evangelism. We're prone to think that evangelism is a professional position. Like evangelism is only for pastors, for those who are gifted, those who are dedicated for this specific ministry. Uh, We have a pastor who oversees this uh, ministry, and we should pray for him. And we should pray for the church to be engaged in all these ministries. Um, Outside of our church, there are even bigger organizations like Billy Graham and Campus Crusade for Christ that specifically engage, uh, or Living Waters, that specifically engage in evangelizing the lost. We ourselves might not be so involved in evangelism, but we might be sending money overseas helping people financially, generally not thinking about evangelism specifically, but we ourselves somehow connected. Uh, Kind of a creature's uh, in a habit of helping people. My, My goal is not to discourage whatever we are doing here. My goal is to encourage and to help us think through what is evangelism. The question that I would like to ask you guys and ask throughout the sermon is, what is evangelism? I bet if I ask, give you an opportunity to give me an answer, all of you would have an opportunity to say. All of you would say some kind of definition. Evangelism is, talking to people about Jesus, evangelism is when we do big events. Evangelism when we do light, Christmas joy, light and joy or something. Evangelism, so we do have certain perspective of what is evangelism. Let's look at the definition. This is not a foreign word. This is actually a Greek word that is used throughout the New Testament. It is, it is used as a euangelion, um, and put it, it is combined from two words. Eu means good, well, and agelio means to proclaim or tell. Literally means to proclaim good or tell good. Or no, another way to put it, to proclaim good news or preach good news. Um, This word formalized in Greek or Roman period for this specific ministry, ministry of Christ. But previously, it was used in eight to six centuries before Christ. Like 400 years before Christ, this word was actually used, and it's used in a context of giving reward. Uh, Connection to offering a sacrifice as a token of gratitude to gods for having received good news from them. So people would bring sacrifice as a token when they hear something from their gods as good news. But before Christ even arrived, there was a connection that good news, evangelism, gospel, this is all uh, one word that is translated different, in reference to hearing something, something good, something uh, that will change their life. The word is, in the context, is often also used as an announcement of a divine ruler's birth. Like the whole uh, city or the whole country is awaiting to hear when a king's son has been born. And somebody comes out there and announces, the son has been born, you know, and that sounded like good news or coming of age, or the enthronement, that this person will be the king. So so in in reference to king's speeches, his decrees, um, bringing hope to fulfillment to those who are waiting, that is how the word used before Christ. So it's for a special announcement that people are waiting for. It's not just dedicated for good news. Um, No one likes to hear bad news, right? Uh, We probably hear a lot of bad news. I received a phone call recently, and the person said, 
You want to hear bad news or the good news? Um, nobody likes to hear bad news. Um, bad news is usually associated with losing money, losing time, losing something valuable. Mm, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't like to hear bad news. Good news is associated with something, gaining something, excitement. Uh, you know, a husband comes in or a wife comes in, I got good news for you, and there's excitement. What is it? What is it? So the word evangelism, the word evangelism is connected to the atmosphere wherein good news is reported. But the New Testament specifically took this word and applied it to the arrival of Jesus Christ. So when people were preaching, where people in the church were going out and talking about Jesus, they were using this word specifically to Jesus' arrival. In the New Testament, it is stated 55 times. And it's translated often as preach, preached, preaching the gospel or the good news. All referencing, all reference to the coming of the Messiah, to coming of Jesus. Almost half of the occurrence in the letter of Luke and Acts, the same author, None written in the Gospel of John. This word is never mentioned in the Gospel of John. It doesn't mean there was no evangelism. The concept was there. A couple times used in the book of Revelation and Matthew, and the rest in the book of Epistles. Let's look how this word began to be used. And the first time when we see is when an angel appeared to Zacharias in a temple, and the angel said these words. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Interesting. The message of good news is not a message of a preacher, is not a message of somebody else. He says, I am Gabriel who stand in the presence of God. Every day I stand in the presence of God, and God sent me here to tell you good news. That should excite everybody. God has a message. What was this good news the angel brought to Zechariah? Angel told Zechariah, you're going to have a son who will prepare the way for the Messiah. The good news is your son, John the Baptist, will participate in the arrival of the Messiah. God wanted people to know good news. God wanted people to know the Messiah's coming. He sent an angel to Zechariah, and then he sent an angel for some, uh, to other people in order to proclaim, announce good news, and that good news is Jesus is coming. In verse 11... Angel says, for today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's in Luke 2.11. So, the arrival of good news, the arrival of good news, has to be connected to the coming of the Messiah. This is something that God wants us to know. Remember when God created uh, the first day, second day, third day, fifth day, sixth day. Remember, and every time he created and he looked at his creation, what did God say? This is good. This is good. So on the seventh day, he rested. In Genesis 3, what happened? What was good was cursed. What was good was corrupted. And God says that to Eve, you will have, um, he will, you know, remember he was talking about Satan, and he will bite you on the feet, and you will crush over him. Remember that promise? I'm not kind of paraphrasing. But God, at that moment, he gave a promise that even there is sin, even there is curse, there's a promise of a seed, promise of hope. 
And throughout the Old Testament, this seed, this genealogy we see. Why do we read genealogy? This and this give birth, this and this and give birth. It's the direction, it's the connection of a seed from Genesis 3. Of a connection to Jesus Christ. Look at Luke, at the beginning of Luke. Open the book of Luke, chapter 1. You have all these genealogies. Why is that all the genealogies? It's because of that promise that God gave in the Garden of Eden that there will be a Messiah. So once again, God creates something new. And God creates something good. John Baptist, when you grow up and begin preaching, he sends his disciples to question Jesus. Look what he says in Matthew eleven four to 6 Go and report to John. Uh, uh, this is Jesus tells John's disciple. Go and report to John. Do you hear and see blind receive sight, and the lame walk, and the leopard are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are risen up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. This is the good news. This is evangelism word that we use. The gospel preached to them. So Jesus himself speaks of a good news in referencing to himself. He enters into the synagogue in Luke 4, 18, we see. He takes the scrolls and he, he reads them. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel. Again, this is the word, evangelism. Preach the gospel. Jesus when now he appeared, now he walks and preaches, he uses evangelism in the reference of himself. Every time this word is used in the New Testament, it is used in the arrival of Jesus Christ. God wants people to know good news. He sends an angels. He sends John the Baptist. He sends the Messiah who delivers the good news. And then what happens? He sends the disciples to you delivering the good news. How did this word affect the church? How did evangelism affect the church? Well, look at, let's look. Acts 5.42. And every day in a temple... And from house to house, they kept right on the teaching and preaching. This is the word, evangelio. Preaching Jesus as Christ. They kept delivering good news to the people. How did they deliver good news? By preaching to people about Jesus. Acts 8.4 Therefore, those who have been scattered went about preaching the word, evangelio. Their speech was directed in telling people about Jesus. Here, the word references to the word of Lord, the word of Christ. Now, we see the pattern that arises. It arises every time evangelism took place. Every time evangelism took place, it is taking God's word, taking God's message, and delivering to the people and telling them that Jesus has arrived. This is good news. You might be sitting and say, what's so good about Jesus arriving? What's so good about Jesus arriving? The whole church was impacted in how evangelism took place, because the whole church was dedicated in preaching Jesus to everyone around. Acts 8.25, and they were preaching the gospel, the same word. Then 
Philip opened his mouth and began from the scripture. He preached Jesus to them, Acts 8.40. But Philip found himself in Azotus, and he has passed through, and he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Acts 10.36, the word that he sent to the Son of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Gospel, or evangelism, evangelism is good news that coming from God to us. In Ephesians 4.11, he even says, I gave some pastors, some evangelists. That's the word. There are even some people who are dedicated for this specific ministry. But one thing we could know for sure, one thing we could know for sure, evangelism has to do with preaching Christ. Evangelism has to do with talking to people about Christ. Evangelism has to do with engaging with others about Christ. The church was not focused on forms. The church was not focused on activities. The church was focused on Christ. If we have a lot of activities in the church and the message of Christ is not communicated, that is not evangelism. The whole idea of evangelism is to deliver, to communicate, to speak to people about good news, about Jesus. Second, evangelism has to do with speaking about right Jesus. Speaking about right Jesus. What do I mean by that? I mean Jesus that is of the Gospels. Not the Jesus that we create, or might create, or others create. There are a group of religious people who accepted Christ, but very quickly went back to their religion. They were saying, yes, we accepted Christ. Yes, we believe in Jesus. But don't forget about the circumcision. Don't forget about Judaism. And what they were saying is, Jesus is not enough. What we were doing, how we were living, we need to live like that. To which Paul writes the letter of Galatians. And in, first, in Galatians 1.6, Paul expresses these words. I am amazed, he's surprised that you are so quickly deserted him who call you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. For a different gospel. If people say you need Jesus plus something else, they're preaching a different gospel. They're preaching a gospel that is created by man. You are so quickly leaving the gospel that I preach to you for some other gospel. That, is, that means that there is a right gospel and there's a wrong gospel. That is, there's a right Christ and there's a wrong Christ. What the gospel describes in the New Testament is the right gospel. If the gospel is described that is not in the New Testament, it is the wrong gospel. And today, we have a lot of gospels. We have people make up Jesus. Paul writes the warning in Galatians 1.8 to those who go astray for a wrong gospel, for a wrong Jesus. And this is he writes in Galatians 1.8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach, that's the word, evangelism, to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Wow. Wow. Paul is on fire here. He is saying this is not a place to compromise. He is saying there's a wrong gospel and there's a right gospel. And if you're going the path of wrong gospel, you are to be accursed. 
even if the angel appears to you and begins to tell you other than the gospel here, he says you are to be a curse. A curse means as anathema, referring to which is devoted to destruction. What Paul is saying, let this person be destroyed by God himself for messing up the good news. Now think about it. Two states are at war, United States and North Korea. And the person needs to deliver to North Korean regime that we are going to bomb them if they don't take this. And the ambassador takes the message. And as he flies to North Korea, he says, you know, I don't like the direction that the president has taken. Take this word out. I mean, no, take this out. And you know, it's just too hard, too, too tough. He's not going to like it. Uh, and he makes up his own gospel. He makes up his own message. And that's what happens here. He says, if the person takes the gospel of Jesus Christ and messes it up and creates his own gospel, he is to be accursed. He is to be punished by God himself. Wow, Paul, where is love here? You know, where is love here? Gospel, Jesus, the message of Jesus, becomes high priority. Becomes high priority. Because it has to deal with eternal salvation. You are not the one who want to come to Christ and say, Jesus I know you. We sang songs about you. I've been coming to Christ, I mean, to church about you. But now you're not going to let me in? You see, you don't want to be that person. That way, we need to get it right. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter who the person is. Look, he says, even if I or the angel... It doesn't matter if the pastor or a professor, it doesn't matter if your husband or your wife, it doesn't matter who they are, if they are to preach a wrong gospel, let them be accursed. Some people are there and they're so spiritual that God speaks to them. Was, did that give them permission to mess up the gospel? Think about it. If you're so spiritual, that means you could make things out of nothing? No, you got to get the gospel right. The good news that God himself delivers to the angels, you got to get it right. You can't just make up your own Jesus. John, the disciple of Jesus, he warns about people, about messing up the gospel, messing up the story of Jesus. In 2 John 7, he says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Many deceivers, these are the people that lie. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh, this is deceiver and the antichrist. So think about it. If you are presenting or a person is presenting a wrong kind of Christ, he is an antichrist. He's against the real Christ. He's against the Christ of the Bible. He's against the Christ of the uh, New Testament. Think about it. The person rejects the scripture and says, I don't like the scripture. I don't like this kind of Christ. Let me create my own Christ. 2 John 10, 11 says, if anyone comes to you, does not bring this teaching, he's talking about Christ, do not receive him into your house, do not give him greetings, for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Messing up the gospel, messing up Jesus, is participating in the evil deeds. The worst evil someone who can be done is to mess up the Jesus of the Scriptures. I hear a phrase sometimes, and I'm sure it's not used in a negative way, but we need a le- real Jesus, real Jesus. What does that mean? Do you make up a Jesus of your own? So when we are talking about evangelism. We're not talking about a form, right? We're not talking about method. We, we will talk about next time. We're not talking about, 
here now, you take the brochure, and we have brochures, like, uh, like evangelistic brochures outside, so you guys could grab and connect it to your friends, neighbors, whatever. So we're not talking about you take the brochures, you give this brochure to this person, you're connecting, you're, you're, being, you're, you're participating in evangelism. No, no, the whole idea here is evangelism has to do with the person, the person of Jesus Christ, who he is. Evangelism has to do with the person of Jesus Christ, who he is. Connecting or telling people about the real Jesus who is in the scriptures. Recently, uh, we celebrated my wife's birthday at Quinn's um, Hot Springs. Anybody been there? Um, Great place just for the husband and wife. I don't think it's a great place for kids, but my opinion. Very beautiful place. So we're out there on this pool swimming, and it's kind of relaxing. It's her birthday. We haven't done it for a couple years. Um, school kind of gets you in there. So we're, and then here comes an old old couple. It seems like we're the only younger couple there. The rest were seniors on you know retirement, swimming these pools. But anyways, we're there, and one of these couples approach us, and right away they are getting into my, uh, our face. Jesus Christ and faith and what do we believe and you know I used to be that guy who kind of argues but this time I mean these days I just listen you know if the person wants to say things I'll just listen you know go for it you know I have an ear I'll give my attention I'll blink make sure I'm participating in what you're saying but this time he's engaging and he's like in and he's like two feet away from me and you know we're talking about people in the in the swimming pool two feet away from me that feels uncomfortable a little bit but. He's in your face, and he says, I am a, I'm an apostle. I'm like, okay, really? Yeah, I'm an apostle. Uh, I, have, I have a gift of healing. Wow, okay. Um, and he says, Jesus revealed to me that I'm going to live 130 years. 130 years, yeah. Jesus revealed to me that I'm going to live 130 years. And I'm kind of trying to use, like, logic behind him. Like, um, do you know anybody who lives 125 years? He's like, that's not the point. Jesus revealed to me that I'm going to be 130 years. I said, I don't know anybody who lives 110 years. No, no, no. It doesn't matter. Jesus revealed to me that I'm going to live 130 years. End up, he created himself a Jesus he created himself a Jesus. And then we find out he has a grandson who they adopted. He was born from an uh, uh, addicted mother on drugs, and he was born with deformities because of drugs have that quality of messing up people. And he has a gift of healing, but he can't heal his son or grandson. You know what I mean? Today, we could hear that. We could hear that. People presenting a different Jesus. The one who runs around to please us. To please us. Look, at, look what often people say. Come to Jesus and all your problems are going to be healed. Right? Come to Jesus and he's going to take care of your problems. You're not going to have no problems. He's going to fulfill your desires. He's going to make you happy. He's going to make you rich. He's going to make you wealthy. Jesus is like this genie in the bottle. If you rub him right, he's going to do what you tell him. In fact, you know, that's a quote from a preacher. A television preacher, I was listening to a television preacher last week, and he was telling why people are poor, because they're not giving enough money to the church. He's telling him, you want to be rich, you want to be well, you have to give a lot to church. What is that? Did you ever hear Jesus say that? There's a different kind of gospel that is used in the name of Christ. And today it is popular. Televisions. The Bible says the false teachers will be motivated by their sin. False teachers who are supposed to present Jesus, who are supposed to evangelize, they are motivated by their sin. Look, 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the times will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
The time will come. They will not do sound doctrine. They're going to reject sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers and according to their own desires. We're, we don't need this preacher. He says, I need to repent. We don't need this preacher or a person. He, he is talking about Bible, a Bible. They're going to accumulate their teachers and according to their own desires. Whatever their desires are, they're going to try to find this person. I was talking to a woman who's going to one of the local church here. She's a member, of, she's a member there for 12 years. And openly she says, I'm sleeping with my boyfriend. And I've been going to this church for 12 years. Nothing wrong with that. Do you see the disconnect? Do you see the disconnect? Desires, sinful desires, are trying to be normalized. People will turn away from sound doctrine in verse 4. And will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. They don't want to hear the Bible. People don't even open the Bible. I mean, I connect, I recently, I pointed out to our pastors, I said, there's a, there's a famous pastor who's writing an article, How to Live by the Spirit. None in that article is referencing a scripture. It's based on his spirituality. What kind of dude are you? A heretic? A false teacher? None in a, he was writing a scripture. So what happens is, he thinks he's so spiritual, that means that gives him authority to make up things. They will turn away from sound doctrine. They will turn away from truth. And what they're going to do? They're going to turn aside to myths. Myths. That's a made up story. I think about it. Churches these days might be filled with people coming out and saying jokes. People these days might be full of plays people these days might be full of activities why why think about it because that's what my heart desires but to sit to sit and to hear god's word and to say yes this is god's word and worship god that's kind of fading away myths information that is not true made up by people. Think about it. The first, second Timothy was written by, um, second Timothy was written 2,000 years ago. How many myths have gained att attraction? The preacher has one goal. is not to make up things. The preacher has one goal. is to understand the content of the Bible and to deliver the content without messing it up. The preacher has one goal. If the preacher does not understand the content, does not understand the Bible, and stands up and makes up things, he's a false teacher. He's saying myths based and covering on spirituality. He places himself above authority. Oh, I don't need this. No, I'm spiritual. Jesus talks to me directly. I believe that Jesus can speak to us. Oh, I don't need to study the Bible. No, 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 no. No, I'm spiritual. What is that? What is that? Why did God wrote the book? Why did God left us the word? Why did God send an angel? Why did God send John the Baptist? Why did God send Jesus Christ? Why did then there's apostles and, and prophets and teachers? The person who puts himself and speaks other than the scripture he places himself above authority. He places himself as spiritual people. But there's a problem. That is based on lie. That is based on lie. They call it thumb theology. They sucked it out of the thumb. Thumb theology. Don't make up things. Understand the word of God. Understand the good news. The good news that God delivered. Because it's applicable to our life today. 
2 Peter 2.3 states that these false teachers will exploit people for their money. They will be moved with greed, not with fear of the Lord. They say, Jesus loves you. Come as you are. No, 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 no. Repent. Repent. Jesus says, Jesus, you know, stay where you are. Do what you No, 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 no. I don't know what Jesus they're preaching. But that's not Jesus of the Bible. They say, Jesus, Jesus is going to fulfill the desires of your heart. What kind of desires of your heart is there? Lust? Pride? Sinful ambitions? Jesus is going to fulfill that? Luke 9, 23. Jesus says these words. These, these, these are Jesus' words about desires of our heart. And he said, he was saying to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses the forfeit himself? Jesus says, you want to follow me? Deny the desires of your heart. Deny your life. If you want to save your life, you'll lose it. Lose it for my sake. Of course we would love Jesus, made up Jesus, because we could be in our sins. Of course we would like to say made up Jesus because we are more comfortable. Jesus says, no, you want to follow me? You want to follow me? Deny everything about yourself. That means denying our desires. That means losing our life for Jesus. That means if we need to be persecuted and burned at the stake, we will do that. That means if it is uncomfortable for us in certain areas because of sin, we will leave. Having, following Jesus means having a difficult life means being persecuted, means being unwelcome. Jesus says in John 15, 8, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. We should not be surprised if the world hates us because they hated Christ. Verse 20, remember the world I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If, the, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. John 15, 20. And Next verse, but all these things they will do to you for my sake. That's the key. They will do that for my sake. Because we have Jesus. We believe in Jesus. And they would want to kill us because we stand and follow Jesus. And for thousands of years, Christians have died for Christ. Chinese government are now attacking Christians. Arresting pastors, arresting Christians. North Korea is, is another tragedy. These are the people that say, I will follow Jesus. And that means all the comfort of their life is forsaken. Jesus promises hardship. Jesus prom promises rejection. If you want to follow Jesus. Do you want to Jesus? Do you want to follow this kind of Jesus? And we have preachers coming along and saying, no, 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 no. The Jesus, he is so loving, he is so forgiving, but they're forgetting. They're forgetting. This loving and forgiving Jesus, he died on a cross. That costed his life. We have preachers coming along and saying, he will give the desires of your heart. Well, I know Satan says he will give the desires of your heart. Jesus will save you from those desires. John 16, 23, 29. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations. That's the promise Jesus makes. 
In the world, you will have tribulations, but take courage. I have overcome the world. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to preach the gospel? What does it mean to evangelize? You don't sugarcoat Jesus. Jesus in 10, 37 says, He who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. That's the Jesus of the Bible. And he who loves the son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follows me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost it for life for my sake will find it. Wow. Jesus wants it all. Jesus wants it all. No wonder people are disappointed when people say, come to Jesus, he will heal you, or he'll make you rich, or he'll make your life better, and they come to Jesus and life is not better. No matter, they feel disappointed. I have numerous stories, and when I talk to people, it says, oh, Jesus is not real, because I prayed, prayed, and he never answered. There was a crowd that followed Jesus. Everybody's following Jesus. I'm following Jesus. Oh, he's preaching. I'm listening to him. He's feeding. I'm there. It's kind of kind of a popular thing, thing to do. The crowd is going after Jesus. Jesus turns to them and says in John 6, 26, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loves and were filled. That's the modern Christianity. Seeking need Jesus, not because of Jesus. Seeking Jesus because they could get something from him. Today, we need to hear about a real Jesus. A Jesus who could save us from our desires. A Jesus who could save us from our sins. A Jesus who doesn't promise his Rolls Royce, but promises to die on the cross, who doesn't promise you to live in a mansion, but promise to be with you when you are persecuted. That's what people do church hopping. Oh, I'll go to this church because I am more comfortable. What, what, what's the reality? Well, because I could be in sin and not be offended that I'm in sin. That's the only reason people do church hopping. Because they choose teachers according to desire versus saying, Lord, save me from my desires. Lord, save me because I'm sinking, I'm drowning. No, 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 no. I need somebody to help me live in my sin. Gospel, good news, good news begins with a holy, righteous God. He who made the heavens and the earth, the Lord who is the lords of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in buildings, and he does not seek man's services. He is all-sufficient, all-powerful, almighty. He is holy and righteous, and his wrath is against the wickedness of sin. If you're minimizing your sin, then you're minimizing the wrath of God on the cross, the destroyed Christ. Gospel begins, the good news begins with a creator, with God, holy and righteous. And he's out there to destroy the wickedness of man. Second, good news begins with understanding who we are. Why did Jesus is called Savior? Savior, save us from what? Yesterday, I listened to a preacher who said, men are good. There are 99.9% .9 who are good today. That's not what the Bible presents. This is a preacher who preaches on national televisions. I'll, I'll tell you the name everybody mostly like, knows. No, 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 no. Man is not good. 
the lady came to uh, to her house, and and um, uh, she grew up in a religious context, and she came for different reasons. But we got uh, we we uh, stayed and had a conversation, and the conversation led for like three hours, and we're like, it's ten o'clock. Kids need to be put to bed. But anyways, we're engaged in conversation. In the three hours, I'm trying to convince her that she's a sinner and she needs a savior. And she's, for three hours, trying to defend that she's perfect. That they, she's sleeping with a man that has no husband. And there's a couple of other issues. No, 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 no. I am good. Why? Why? I did the Ten Commandments. Ephesians 2, 1 says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. What that means is we're physically alive, but morally unable to do the righteousness of God. And that is why the wrath of God is upon us. Isaiah 64, 6, for all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like the filthy garment. This is our righteous deeds. Romans 3, 10 as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. And people come around and says, I am good. I'm not bad. If we don't understand the condition of our sin and where we are, why do we need a Savior? Think about it. If we don't understand that because of our sin, we're going straight to hell, why do we need Christ? That's a delusion. We need to understand that all of us are not good and we're going to hell. That's why we need a Savior. That's why there's good news. We don't have to die for our sins. We don't have to receive God's wrath anymore. All of us turned from God into our own wickedness. But now, God has good news that his son came down, lived the perfect life, went up on the cross, and died for you. So you could be righteous. If you Repent of your sin and trust Jesus. The righteousness is not that I'm doing good anymore. No, no, no. The righteousness is that I have trusted my life into Christ, his righteousness, his atonement, what he did on the cross. And because I've trusted him, now God appoints, makes me righteous apart from me. Apart from me. Romans 3, 23 even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Not by being good, not for doing good, but just because I accepted Christ. Romans 3.28, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from, from the works of the law. And that is the good news. That is the good news. I am saved not because I am Christian, not because I go to church, not because I do some good deeds. I am saved apart from my works because I trusted my life into Christ. Jesus, the Son of God, was born a virgin, lived a perfect life, went up on the cross. And he went up on the cross to receive the wrath of his Father, the wrath of God for our sins, your sins. That is the good news. You now don't have to die in your sins. You can receive this eternal life. That is the good news. That is evangelism. If we participate in any form of evangelism and don't communicate the holiness and the righteousness and the wrath of God and the wickedness and that these people need a savior, we miss the point. We created an atmosphere when people like sitting, talking. We created an event that is comfortable for our own desires. But these people are going straight to hell. I want to talk to the non-Christians today, 
if you have not received Christ, not accepted Christ, not given your life to Christ, would you accept the sacrifice of Christ today on your behalf? Would you say, I believe in that Jesus? Would you accept Christ today, his righteousness, that everything that needs to be done is done on your behalf in Christ? Would you turn from your wickedness and turn to Christ? Evangelism has to do with helping people understand their sin, their wickedness and the righteousness of God on the cross. How we do it might be here from the pulpit. How we do it it might be your coworker. How we do it, it might be an event that we do with our church. How we do it, you might pick up a brochure on the way home, and you say, hey, check this out. We're going to talk about next time as a methods, things that we could do. But I want today us to understand that evangelism has to do with the person of Christ, has to do with the forgiveness of sin, has to do with having eternal life. That is the evangelism the scripture presents. Pray with me. Father, how we fall short with our words and with our action. And how majestic is your grace that on the cross there is no sin that you have not forgiven. Help us understand that following you will cost us everything. It will cost us our comfort. It will cost us our sin. It will cost us the desires of our heart because we love you above everything else. And if there are people here who have not truly followed you. Let, to be, let today be the day when we follow you. Let, to be, let today be a day when we receive the sacrifice, accept the sacrifice that you have done on a cross. Help us as a church to be a church of, that evangelizes, that presents the Jesus of the Bible, not, not the Jesus that people want to hear. Bless the pastors, and I pray for a pastor who receives evangelism. Give him a heart that he can be leading the way for us here, preaching the good news to those because you have gifted him with this gift.